Hi, welcome to part four of the Sound Basics series of videos. This video, we're gonna talk about resonance, which is kind of a real important part of how sound functions and travels around. So let's start with the basic principle of the superposition of waves, all right? So here we have a nice animation that shows two wave pulses, and you can imagine uh, maybe two people standing at different ends of the room, talking or doing something like that, and coming together from opposite ends of the room, so you see what happens here is when they come, the two peaks come together, they add up, right? And become a much bigger peak. And as they pull apart, they go back to their own ways. So sound, and I think I mentioned this before several times, is a linear medium, meaning that its energy just adds or subtracts to each other. So if you have two different waves, if one is being compressed and the other one's being compressed, it'll be that much, the, the compression will add up. If one is being rarefacted and the other one is being in the, uh, you know, in the cycle of rarefaction, uh, they'll add up and then there'll be more rarefaction. If one is in the cycle of rarefaction, one is um, in compression, then they'll cancel each other out, okay? So that brings us to constructive and destructive interference. Now there's a little uh, mathematical equation if that interests you. And you can see from this animation here, as the waves move together, as they're completely out of phase, and remember we talked about phase here, they completely cancel each other out right there. And as they get back in phase, they double up, right? Okay. Now, just like these are traveling in different directions, you can imagine uh, waves, say, like in a room or some kind of enclosed space, traveling in different directions from each other, all right? Now, if we get if we get the same wave exactly, um, amplitude, frequency, and wavelength, and they're traveling in opposite directions, um, we get what's known as a standing wave. Okay, and you'll get you'll you'll get of these standing waves in low frequency, uh, sort of like bass, bass tones, and stuff like that in, in a room because the free, the uh, wavelengths are so long. Uh, and, and you can tell by, if you if you get like a good subwoofer and run some kind of low frequency content through your room, you can walk around the room and you can hear um, like valleys and troughs because there's standing waves going on. So you can hear where basically the sound seems to go away completely. And then if you walk around a little bit more, you can hear where the sound is like very, very loud. And so this is ideas. If you have these opposite waves traveling opposite directions, you get uh, kind of like these waveforms that s stay still in the room right? A standing wave. So this point right here in the room uh, will always be no sound, will be neutral. And then if you move over here, it'll be a peak. And if you move over here, it'll be neutral, right? Because the, 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 the waves are traveling in opposite directions, giving this constructive interference and um, uh, constructive and destructive interference, I'm sorry. Okay. And well, we won't worry about beats right now but it's on the same principle. So that's just the one thing to, to realize about resonance and standing away um, and uh, constructive and destructive interference. Things reinforce sound, certain objects or certain things or certain rooms or certain areas will reinforce, reinforce certain frequencies, all right? So these have to be traveling at a certain frequency in, relative, in, in, in relation to the room to create this sort of specific standing wave. So let's look at let's look at a few standing waves. The standing waves are being used in a, a number of different um, applications, uh, a lot of sort of industrial applications. And one is um, you can use standing waves to, to levitate. You can use acoustic levitation. So let's look at a little video about acoustic levitation. This is an acoustic levitator. Uh, it's single axis, which means that, would, that we only control things on uh, one axis here. Um, so we have two horns or transducers. Um, okay. Anytime I see an oscilloscope, I get excited. So am I going to hear it on the camera? You'll, so the main fre frequency we're using, again, is 22 kilohertz, which is higher than human hearing. Um, but what you'll be hearing is a subharmonic around 17, 18 kilohertz. But I can just put a low-pass filter on the audio and I can... I'm guessing that you cut it out, yeah. Okay. You turn it up, and on the oscilloscope, you'll see the two waves from each of the two horns. Well, let's think and levitate something, dude. Yeah. So that's just a styrofoam ball. A styrofoam ball, and the spoon has all those slots in it, so the sound passes right through it. No way. And then I can just... And by it. sound, you mean pressure. Yeah, the sound waves, which are pressure waves, I mean. But you can see the, the wavelength spacing, basically, between these. 
That's stinking awesome. You may have seen sound drawn like this, but it's a bit too simplified. A real sound wave actually looks like this. The bright parts are the higher pressure and the darker parts are the low pressure. These ripples move along at the speed of sound. When you have two identical sound waves and you line them up just right, they no longer act like waves moving across the room. If you have a wave coming from this side and another wave coming from the other side, they become what's called a standing wave. You get a spot right here where there's a pressure flipping on and off and a spot right here where the pressure isn't changing at all. There's no oscillation. If you flip this thing upright and then you put something tiny right inside that little pocket, you can use that air pressure to bump something up against the force of gravity. So it ends up looking like this ping pong paddle. The particle wants to drop, but it keeps getting knocked back up by the high pressure wave below it. And that is acoustic levitation. So if it works with foam, it should work with water, right? Anthony uses a syringe to balance little drops of water on top of that oscillating wave. Just like the ping pong ball, you can see it bouncing up and down. Look at the one on the bottom, bouncing up and down trying to find its spot. Another cool thing is the fact that if I make the water drops too big, they always seem to explode. Why would it do that? It happens just a little too fast to see with the naked eye. <laughs> Yeah, so the part uh, that I cut out there was the Smarter Everyday guys were able to get their hands on a high-speed camera, and the things you saw there were, in fact, um, uh, uh, levitating liquid, but if you turn up the amplitude enough, you'll basically explode the little liquid things. So there's acoustic levitation, basically the principles you have the standing wave, which is, in, in a sense, uh, 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 um, uh, just a pressure wave, you know, just a kind of little pockets of pressure keeping these either styrofoam balls or uh, drops of liquid up. And I, 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 I think it's being used in um, the pharmaceutical industry as well as um, some industrial applications. Uh, you know, basically you can, without touching stuff, you can move things around depending on the density, say, of the liquid. All right, um, here's another example of some standing waves. And this is, uh, unfortunately, video is in Japanese, but you, you'll kind of get the point. And they've, they've created these special tanks that can actually create specially shaped standing waves, not just, uh, you know, like across a room, but uh, these 3D standing waves. And these have, again, a, a bunch of sort of um, industrial applications as well. So let's have a look. それでは<笑> ハートのマーク。実際の海の波をいかに近づけて作るかっていう研究をしている。その過程でこういうことです。できる。自然界で起こり得るあらゆる波を再現できるこの装置。最新のテクノロジーがこうした魔化不思議な現象を可能にしています
gone back and forth in the bathtub. All of a sudden you realize that you get to a certain uh, speed of going back and forth and, and the water just kind of moves itself. You don't have to do very much to it. Uh, swing is the same way. If you start, if you kick it just the right time, uh, you don't have to kick that much. You just hit the sort of frequency of resonance. That's the deal that has to do with like the length, the length of the, um, the swing. Um, uh, you know, all kinds of things. You see this all the time. So uh, basically everything, uh, you know, and, and I guess according to string theory, everything in the universe really has these basic resonant frequencies. Um, uh, you can find a frequency that will, will create a natural oscillation in, in an object. And so uh, famously Tesla, Nikola Tesla, um, was really, really interested in resonance, and he did a lot of things. He was um, uh, purported to have created this machine, something, something along the kinds of this, that, that he thought could, could uh, you know, a small machine that you could attach to, like a skyscraper building, and bring it down. Like you would come up, find the national resonant frequencies, and it could make a building collapse. And, and the idea behind this, this is, this is one of his actually original uh, uh, Tesla machines, these resonant machines, or earthquake machines. Um, what, what was fascinating was he, he coupled a sensor um, that would sort of sense the, the vibrations, the, re the vibration of here, and a, and a vibrator, and this, the sensors would adjust this. So as the vibrations become, um, come greater, uh, it would change the frequencies of the, the oscillator so that you can, it would help you find the resonant frequency of any object. So let's watch this. This is the additional video to show Tesla mechanical oscillator that we've shown in detail during the Westcom exhibit. Just to repeat, so you know, this side, it's a Tesla electromechanical oscillator that transmits the oscillations. It can be used to test the strength of the material or to send the signals. The other one is a receiver that can receive mechanical oscillators and interpret the data. These are the patents. It's popularly called earthquake machine. This now is covering the whole table. This table has a two frequencies. It has the one that that remembering the whole table and separate one that affects mostly the work. This also has effect on a floor and uh, can alert the neighbors. So that's why there's a short test. Thanks for watching. Right, so you, you notice there, not only was was the machine making the cabinet um, oscillate, but also, uh, I guess, the floor as well. And I think a Mythbusters did a, a thing with just using like a, um, uh, just a little sort of actuator uh, on a bridge, and they could actually feel the vibrations. It didn't bring the bridge down, but they could actually feel the vibrations down quite, quite a far ways down the bridge. And this is all due to resonance. These natural resonant frequencies are very powerful. And form the foundation of basically our instrumental, um, uh, uh, our, our instruments, right? So something like a violin has uh, natural resonances that are captured by the, the, the tuning of the strings, the, the, the plates themselves have natural resonances, the top plate and the bottom plate of the violin, and then even the cavity w between the plates has sort of these natural resonances. So violin makers will, will tune these resonances to the, the pitches of the open strings. So you get this very, very rich, warm, amazing sound. In fact, a, a violin is kind of a miracle of resonance. It's such a small little thing, and, it, and yet it produces a very, very loud sound. You can, you can imagine it's all acoustic. You know, there's no electronics or anything involved, and it's such a small sort of very efficient resonator. Uh, you know, that's an example of finding these resonant frequencies. Um, you know, flutes, brass, woodwinds, they all operate on various, various um, uh, resonances of columns of air, finding these natural resonances and such. Uh, okay, and maybe one of the most famous examples of resonance uh, is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. So let's see a, just a little snippet of, of that. 
on the 1st of July, 1940. A delegation of citizens met in Washington state. The weather was beautiful, the occasion historic, and the speech making and fanfare altogether appropriate. This was the grand opening of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. From the beginning, the bridge, which spanned Puget Sound between Seattle and Tacoma, was traveled in style, as well it should have been. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge was one of the longer suspension bridges on Earth. And if somebody hadn't overlooked something, it probably would have remained one of the longer suspension bridges on Earth. The problem wasn't that right from the beginning, a lot of people didn't pay a lot of attention to details. They did. But somewhere along the line, and this was obvious in the end, it looks as if someone forgot the significance of resonance. Among other things, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was the most spectacular Aeolian harp in history. Unfortunately, its first performance was destined to run only about four months. In the meantime, she was a beautiful bridge. Beautiful, but a little strange. Even before construction was completed, people observed its peculiar behavior. That was because, even in a light breeze, ripples ran along the bridge. After a while, one of the local humorists called her Galloping Gertie. And for fairly obvious reasons, the name stuck, at least until the 7th of November, 1940. Then as now, Seattle and Tacoma were sports-minded cities. For four months, a regional sport was to drive across the bridge on a windy day. While some claimed it was like riding a roller coaster, others found it a little disconcerting to see the car in front disappear. How popular this bridge sport was, or to what extent it might have spread across the country, is anybody's guess. On November 7, 1940, the winds were relatively moderate, about 40 miles per hour. A new mode appeared. Rather than ripple, the bridge began to twist. A wind of 40 miles per hour is not too strong, but it was strong enough to start the bridge twisting violently. At 11 a.m., it fell. Amazing. Right. So there you go. We have the uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge. That was just brought down by its natural resonant frequencies. Such a huge structure still had its frequencies. And so, for example, there's um, published materials there about uh, different bridges and their natural frequencies. And here we have um, uh, the, the, the resonant frequencies of the Golden Gate Bridge, right? So you have um, uh, the transverse, and we know uh, what, what that is. Sound waves are transverse, runs parallel. The movement runs parallel. And we're talking about... Uh, a wave actually going through the bridge itself, right? So traveling through the solid material of the bridge. Uh, um, you know, waves can even move in, in more tightly packed molecules through solids as well. Sound can move. And its natural frequency is 0 0.055 hertz. All right. And then we have a vertical longitudinal torsional. These are various, various um, uh, longitudinal is just kind of like the um, Tacoma Narrows bridge there up and down. Um, various types of movement that can happen in the bridge. And um, again, you have these different natural frequencies. So I suppose if you got an oscillator that was kind of strong enough, you could try to vibrate the bridge at one of these frequencies and see if you can get the, the bridge moving at some kind of mode of resonance. Okay. Um, of course, I'm not sure about the 
at the time of the Golden Gate Bridge, but nowadays for sure, we um, we uh, uh, have like retrofitting and springs and stuff like that 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 they've learned since the Tacoma Narrows Bridge to try to foil resonance that it doesn't doesn't keep at a solid resonant frequency. All right, um, so let's look at a, a couple more a couple more just sort of more f like fun videos to show uh, that show a famous example, the famous sort of holy grail of resonance is to try to break a shatter glass using your voice. And again, the, it's the same kind of ideas that you're going to try to find with your voice, the natural resonant frequency of a um, of the glass itself. A crystal glass has a natural resonance. This is the frequency at which it most efficiently turns sound waves into physical movement. Play a glass its own resonant frequency, but loud, and it may move so much that it explodes. They're using lead crystal, as it's the most efficient at transforming sound into motion. This lowest peak here is the, is the fundamental frequency, and uh, I'm reading off here 562 hertz, so uh, that's where we should start. With the computer primed to belt out a pure 562 hertz tone, it's myth-busting time. So this is Mythbuster, Mythbuster's wine glass breaking test number one, simply playing a tone through the speaker to the glass. That's it. I'm really sorry. I need to actually plug that speaker into something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, details, details. <laughs> Even the Meyer Mythbuster can make mistakes. Let's try that again. Nothing. But in opera, it's not over till the fat lady sings, and Rogers had a harmonious idea. When you listen to the glass, it has many harmonics above the fundamental frequency. And so maybe it's not the fundamental that breaks it. Maybe we need to produce one of those harmonics. Up to now, Roger's just been playing the fundamental frequency. But there are also many other equally spaced smaller peaks, the harmonics. So this time, the computer's set to blast out the full harmonic sound, an exact match of the glass. Adam also throws a straw into the mix to help see if the glass is moving at all. straw dances. This glass really is vibrating. Just check out the high speed. The glass is as wobbly as jello, but not wobbly enough to implode. Back for his encore. Buster's exclusive, 556 hertz, 105 decibels, and 20 attempts makes for a world first. History's been made, and it's been captured on high speed, so there's really no need to try this one at home. Well, that's it. We My name's Chase, and I live in California, and I'm going to try to break this wine glass by only my voice. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, 
So um, there you go, resonance. Um, um, yeah, so why are we talking so much about resonance? Well, in our next video, we're going to examine the resonance of a, a, a just a single string. So sort of a 1D look at resonance. And it turns out that we, we're going to be able to build a whole sort of model of the way sound works. We're going to hold, try to build this whole uh, sonic model uh, based on the resonance of a string. So Because it turns out that a string doesn't only have one mode of resonance. Um, in fact, it has many, many modes of resonance that are happening simultaneously. And you can excite them depending on if you hit certain frequencies. And then those frequencies have a particular relationship to each other, which is very interesting. And that kind of sort of forms the forms the foundation, forms builds a model of the way we hear sounds and the and the types of sounds, the way the, the, the sounds sound to us. So like the timbre of the sounds, the color of the sounds are really based on these kind of modes of resonance. So by looking at a single string, like a simple string, uh, we're going to be able to construct this model. So join us then for part five when we talk about um, uh, string modes of resonance.